Alrighty, I am going to start recording. Here we are. Oh, my friend Angela is here. And let's see if the fourth time is a charm with my new friend, Ethar. Uh, yes, no. Nope. Yes. No. Nope. No. Nope. Uh, okay. <laughs> so long on my microphone. Works, somehow, some way. <laughs> Sorry, let's guys. See. I pressed on the audio for you, and okay. that doesn't seem to Not do anything. Okay. Work. See I followed you as a Twitter person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely getting audio on my side. Um, Angela, whenever you want to um, ask for a seat, please, please do so. It would be great to have you. Yeah, there you are. Let's see if your audio works, and maybe there's a magic ticket for it. Hello, Angela. I can sort of see the square kind of activating okay. I see you now can I hear you hello can you hear me we can I can hear you here's the beautiful thing I can now hear everyone yeah oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so so Wonderful. my audio is going by Angela. excellent <laughs> so right now we are three countries being represented um, so you're still in the UK correct Ethar I am indeed yes at the moment absolutely wonderful Just got you're in oh, London yesterday. Oh no, in Manchester. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. So, back again. Yeah. And so we've got Pittsburgh in the That's me. Hi. <laughs> and I'm I'm here in Brussels where apparently the action yeah. is. So, yeah. <laughs> or hopefully isn't anymore. Right. Wow. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, I feel like you know, one of the I don't even know the right word for it, but you know, this this whole energy, the game changer movement was started with the shootings at Sandy Hook Elementary School. And that was almost three and a half years ago now. And and I guess it's a blessing and a curse when when different countries get to experience what 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 we experienced three and a half years ago and what continues to be experienced all over the planet. And right. um I, I, you know, it, it's it's going to be sort of a roller coaster conversation because um, a lot's happened in the past week or so in okay. in this trip, uh, including getting to meet Ethar. So, uh, so Angela, meet meet Ethar. <laughs> Ethar, I just met this past Monday, um, and uh, and he is already feeling like a lifer in the game changer movement, which is wonderful. <laughs> wow, that's great. That's great. So, Ethar, what do you do? I work surprisingly in in IT and uh, what they call enterprise architecture or lean enterprise. Mm -hmm. Right. So basically, right. trying to change the, the game changer, if you like, position I take is changing how enterprises work, making them more effective, less wasteful, sometimes more socially aware. That's the sort of line I take on a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. By yourself. Well, um, I'm in a PhD program at Carnegie oh, Mellon awesome. for um, cultural <laughs> studies. Okay, but awesome. a couple of years ago, I escaped from academic libraries, and now I'm <laughs> making my way somewhere else that I'm not sure quite where that's going to go. A coach for moms for okay, now. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But I've got two kids, and we talk a lot about video games and violence. They're little yeah. still, 9 and 13. Mm -hmm. But I also had a friend that was teaching at Sandy Hook when that really? shooting happened, okay. and she survived, but she's she stayed another year, but she just couldn't stay anymore i mean that it's like the soil is saturated with just grief you know yeah exactly absolutely mm -hmm. well, out of that out of that her daughter has become really actualized in the face of those events and she's uh in college in george washington she's on MSNBC, she's speaking for the millennials that want mm -hmm. to prevent gun violence so there's a lot that's going on for me in my head, I guess, about that. Mm -hmm. So anyway, well, it's that's a cultural problem. You, it, you very much so. What's going on in your head? I mean, you know, here we are. I mean, it's interesting because in you know in Brussels, this is a, a holiday day, and I and I'm learning that for the first time ever. Like in in the states, you know, Easter money Easter Monday doesn't have um, as much of a ring to it, if you will. Right. Um, right. Yeah because it yeah, seems like echoey. It's not working. So uh, I've got got 
we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna have like sort of a game changer movement virtual living room first and have three people in one uh, one screen. So so we've got Carol to my right, your okay, left, Carol. and Erica to ah! my left, your right. <laughs> Hello, everyone. And, uh, Hi. Hi. How are you doing? Hello. Awesome. Oh, yay! It's one big happy family. <laughs> so we've got. Yeah, lots of great new people <laughs> and three, three countries represented. So, um, so Erica, do you want to introduce yourself and just let people know huh? who you are and what sure. you do in the world? So my name is Erica, and I work here in Brussels, and uh, I work with the U.S. Embassy giving out scholarships. And I've been here for ten years in Belgium, and cool. I'm happy to be here. Excellent. Please meet you. <laughs> And awesome, and, and here's Carol. Okay. <laughs> so Carol's been on the show before. Do you want to say anything? Or? Yeah. Um, my name's Carol Solvay, and I have a son that likes video games, and I'm concerned, and um, I want to raise consciousness on the planet Earth, so I'm into this. Hey. Nice. Awesome. Nice to meet you both. <laughs> yeah, so let's see if we can. <laughs> Good. We've, we've all had garlic, so, so <laughs> there's a few hundred miles. I think we should be safe. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> so, so um, you know, the the one thing that I wanted to to share before we like dove into conversation is just like how amazing this week has been, just in the yeah. move of the game changer movement. And um, you know, I don't want to spend too much time because it's just you know we'll we'll use other ways of doing the update, but. I don't know what. So, Ethar and I, and, and Carol and I, went to visit the Graphene Institute, um, which is. Oh yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I was kind of building this crowd up about you know this this trip, and you know we had no idea. We didn't hear anything back from anyone who had uh, who I had emailed, um, but due to uh, due to our friend Ethar who knew where it was and a little American rule breaking game changing behavior. Show up, baby, just show up. <laughs> yeah. So so I think that's the whole point is like, you know, it's how do we show up and when and and um and I feel like you know what what happened in in Brussels uh you know what it did for my heart is that it just basically said, you know, um I no longer fear dying. I I fear not living. And, right. and what it means for me to live is to live fully into purpose. And so with that energy, uh, Ethar, Carol, and I um, went, <laughs> no invitation, no true communication to the Graphene Institute. And <laughs> I played stupid in a way, and um, but also persistent. And, and we were able to make an inroad with a gentleman named Paul, who works as a research assistant within the the hundred person graphene institute and um and ethar yeah. ethar was so uh how do you say instrumental in chiming in right at the right time and just made it all magic as well mm -hmm. absolutely wow. awesome <laughs> yeah so so, th so that was the beautiful manchester part you know I, I feel like you know i mean sometimes you don't know exactly why you're called to a place and, and becoming friends with Ethar, I, I know for sure if nothing else happens as a result of that trip, it was worth it just to get to know you, Ethar. So thank you. I'm gonna say this publicly. You know, you're you're a really awesome soul. So thank you for being uh, you. Uh, I know I couldn't live up to all this now. <laughs> So with, with that said, what, what I haven't gotten a chance to share with you, Ethar, and, and, and definitely you, Angela, is that um, uh, following the, the time in Manchester, we were able to meet with a gentleman by the name of Robert Murray Smith, who has his own YouTube channel about sort of the DIY world of oh. graphene, mm -hmm. make, like do-it-yourself graphene, you know? Yeah. Um, but of course, you know, as fate would have it, we also learned that he was associated with the Graphene Institute and he's sort of, you know, the, um, the ambassador of goodwill and, and connection around um, all things Graphene in the world. And he's got lots of different projects all over uh, this globe. And somehow due to like his schedule, he was in Canada a few days before we connected and now and 
presented himself as as available to meet in London, and he showed up. Wow. Uh, having met just from YouTube to his email to a cafe in London, um, unbelievable. We spent about two hours with each other, and um, we had this amazing conversation, which led to you know follow up steps. One is he uh, he gave us the uh, three mathematical models of graphene, so we can now send those models to coders who can gamify uh, graphene and how to play with it. You know, from that scenario. And then the other thing we asked him for was an endorsement. And um, so this was the interesting part. So he he wanted to endorse us, and he felt that it it totally was in alignment with his ethos. However, he needed to check in with Edison Electric um, because he's on their board, and right. and he, it's not just Robert saying, right. Uh, right, you know, I like the game changer movement. It's it's Robert from Edison Electric saying I like the game changer movement. So he said that there was going to be a board meeting in the next few weeks that he would get back to us and we would see, you know, they gave their blessing. Within three days of our connection in London, he just sent me an email saying that they were totally on board and you're now going to be endorsed by Edison Electric. And oh my God! Yeah. So, <laughs> wow, so it's just amazing. Really, I mean, it's exponential Absolutely. and it's just really, um, you know, I mean, thank you to all of you because this road has been, uh, there's no way to have made a five year or a three month plan to, you know, to, to create all the magic that's that's happening so yeah. the right mission at the right time with the right people and the right energy so, and edison energy so um so that's all, okay, that's all really good. Hmm? Yeah. that's exciting um, good for you yeah well good for the world in a way because i mean what was interesting you know and and, and ethar and carol could sort of back this up is um, there was sort of this protective um, gatekeeper uh, at the Graphene Institute, and and I, I now I'm in a very interesting place of of compassion because you know for a while I was just like feeling really disruptive and saying you know this oil industry that's right. just got to be you know we just got to get underneath the, the 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 greed of the oil industry, and then all of a sudden I realized you know and partly with the conversation with Idar that. That the the world of academia also wants to make their money. Yes, they and do. And also fearful of the disruptive power of graphene. So, you know, it's a very interesting dynamic. And if we just sat and waited for you know the powers that be to decide that it's time for the world to have graphene, we probably would be waiting ten years. Oh, right. And so, because the game changer movement is here, we're not going to be waiting ten years. <laughs> And and Robert is another reason for that. So um, so with that said, um, you know that's that's the kind of the bravado of the game changer movement. But I, I feel like the underbelly of it is you know something really serious and meaningful happened here in Brussels. And um, in a way, I just don't want to take it as a co coincidence that that I was here when it happened, or you know in Europe when it happened. And, right. And so, you know, just in my heart's solidarity, you know, as the global citizen that I want to be, um, you know, I, I was, uh, I was just, my heart was shattered once again. And then I feel like uh, one of the, the blessings in, in a heart shattering experience is that's when the light comes in, you know, that's when, you know, when, when, when things break, you know, the, the holes are filled with light and, and, um, and so much like what happened with, you know, September 11th in the United States, you know, my prayer is that that's eventually what happens to um, uh, to Brussels because, you know, the U.S. really, really came together as a, you know, as a national community um, and after that day. I don't know what your experience was, Angela, but would you agree that that after... You know, people were just a little softer and they gave a little bit more space for for people to just be human i don't i don't know i experienced that did you experience that angela in the immediate aftermath yes i had a very strong reaction to it and 
<clears throat> I mean, the day of, my neighbor and I sort of went door to door to check on our elderly neighbors. And there was a, a change the feeling on my street. I don't live there anymore, but it was, you know, we've never had anything like that in my lifetime. You know, I'm in my 50s. So it, it was, <laughs> but I am from New England. So I did grow up with the super huge storms and it's a similar kind of thing, right? Everybody kind of takes care of each other. There's a, the face of this great big thing that you can't control. And so if you get three feet of snow, you go check on your neighbors and that kind of major, um, I don't know, that kind of scary shock had that effect in Pittsburgh. And also <laughs> Pittsburgh has a lot of de Department of Defense links. And so there was a real, there was a lot of fear here. And also because we're on the three rivers, we're like, what can I show you? <laughs> Two rivers intersect in Pittsburgh right at that tip. Right. That we're very vulnerable to that kind of, like we can't um, evacuate properly. So there's a lot of banding together in the grocery store with strangers on the highway all the time. I I don't know if it stuck with us though, is the thing. Hmm. Well, I, I, I agree. You know, I mean, my, my experience was that, you know, we did band together and then, mm -hmm. you know, much like you know, the, the lunch I had yesterday, there were all these stories where people were talking about, um, you know, near miss situations. Right. You know, Yesterday, you know, I, I heard from uh, Carol's, you know, family members who were in the airport and they they went left instead of right, and because of that, they were at the lunch yesterday. You know, and those are those are stories that bring people together. You know, and uh, and I feel like Brussels has an opportunity to to coalesce in in a, in a new way, and so so that's that's sort of the phoenix that can rise from the ashes right. in a way. And um, and I'm excited about being being part of the Phoenix. You know, I mean, I feel like uh, this game changer movement, especially now that it's got like real tangible next steps that are moving forward, and um, it's just really excited to to feel um, feel the momentum. And and so, you know, with that said, uh, later in the the trip uh, to the UK. Last night we were uh, in London. We went to visit. Uh, well, we went to watch uh, Marion Williamson speak. Wow. You know of her? Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know her? So, um, and she was in bold. Um, I, I don't know what to say, but like she was, she was giving us a recipe for healing and for for getting through this this what just happened in, in Brussels. And it was really powerful. It's all about taking ownership. And and what she also said that I, I feel like we sh we might want to spend the rest of this time talking about is um, is just conviction. You know, like when you know what she basically said is if you know if we cared and were as convicted about love as these guys were about hate, right. then you know that's the only way to rise up and and really be a, a force of love. Um, as it competed with the, you know, uh, the world that's trying to, you know, breed fear. I mean, that's what terrorism is. Yes, I mean, yes. To kill too many people in order to, um, to make the world afraid again, and right. and so it just it's really important that we come together. And I'm so encouraged by the fact that we're all here on this lab talking about this. You know, days after this this happened, you know, six days and. Uh, and so, you know, what, what terrorists want is for us to close up shop and to, to not move forward, to just fear leaving our houses. And in a way, because technology is what it is, we, we don't have to leave our houses to, you know, to mobilize and, and activate around, around love. So, um, so I feel really, really grateful that you're all here. Um, but what also, in my heart is that we are taking this war and we are packaging it and we are putting it in our kids' living rooms. And that's that's the other energy that, that really hit home for me in a in a more convicted way than ever before. You know what I mean? So when when our kids play games that imitate 
and simulate or you know we're really um, uh, that's an interesting I, I'm, I'm reading some of the side <laughs> conversation so yes I mean overeating might be you know a way that we're <laughs> we're numbing from some of these situations um, but I, I think you know in terms of total death you know like I don't think that's the point I think the point is terrorism is very strategic in that not as many people need to die in order to create in a heightened level of fear and so and then above and beyond that just the idea of bottling this stuff up packaging it and putting it in our kids living rooms that's where it just it felt like oil and water to me more so than ever before i mean you know having experienced a lot of violence in my you know childhood you know i i've never subscribed to it i just don't get it like but but now on a global level i'm just like you know what marion was saying is like like someone was asking different questions and uh and she said not in my house like when when she was growing up parents you know took accountability and they and and if there was something that didn't align with their own values they said not in this house you know? and and that's what we get to um to say you know and from a collective stance and so so eric i want to actually engage what esther is saying in the comments that sure. what the media is not saying is we're winning the isis war and when you were talking about how we're packaging up this war and putting it in our living rooms for our children to consume i was thinking yeah well it's not just the video games because it is all over even you know the l-i-t-e matt lauer morning news right and so in my family, for example, we were somewhere recently and my boy who is 13 said, yeah, I probably will never travel outside of this country because it's just not safe. Mm. And, you know, I backpacked through Europe a couple times in my 20s. And now as, a, you know, 30 years later, I think, God, I can't believe my parents let me do that. And mm. in my head, I always thought, oh, I couldn't take it if my kids did that, blah, blah, blah. But what I said to him was, no, it's not, it looks unsafe, but it's you not unsafe. We have the Go complete ahead. view, American living in Europe. I'm afraid to go to America because there's so many people packing guns. See? I have a fear the opposite direction. Yeah. Um, well, I, I did try to talk to you. They use phones, and, and over there they're using guns. It's just a little bit different. Right, right. And I'm well, curious, Ethar, <clears throat> when you, <clears throat> change uh when you code what kind of games do you make uh, well I, I don't do that so many games these days but back when i did many more and um, they were either they were generally what are called interactive fiction games which are typically you are part of a story if you like and then you have to navigate your way through some scene if you'd like by saying which tells a story associated so for example i'm in the middle of a forest um i'm looking for something um, and I've got to find clues to get that thing. And the same is true of any other sort of context. I used to do that back in the day in text. Um, back in, you know, many, many moons ago when I was young and you were He's even younger. Zork. <laughs> <laughs> there was many, many games I, I sort of got my hands in, in dirty in. But um, over time, I started to work around with 3D games and, and other sort of... I certainly wouldn't call them violent games, though oddly enough, I used to play quite a few zombie-type games yeah. like Doom, Quake, etc. back in my day. Um, so th there's an element of, of either constructive, where I wanted to engage my brain, etc., or being a bit mind-numbing. Something to not, I don't want to say the word relax, because that's the wrong sort of word, if that makes any sense. But it's its not all that engaging. It's just kind of a, a sort of escapism at the time. Yeah. But, Do you remember an old game called Raven? Well, of course. Yes, of course. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Many of those. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and there were many, many games uh, that, that I used to play, but I suppose... When did I stop playing games? I probably would say uh, something like about 15, 16 years ago, probably longer than that, to be fair. Um, preferring to uh, the only games I still play nowadays, if you like, are things like chess, which have a certain strategic element, but are quite dull for most people, dare I say. But I don't know why I moved away from the, the old style games. I suppose it just kind of felt like I grew out of them. And though I, I probably would argue it's a different case for this generation who have probably grow, to grow up with that sort of thing and with the media presenting certain. Um, stories just because they have a kind of half hour time slot or whatever it is and they have to present the newsworthy stuff you get a filtered view of what the world right. is like which just to engage right. you know, so really most people don't have the time some people don't have the inclination or the awareness that they can research their own stuff 
and find out whether or not that information is actually either true or what the full right. story is. I mean, I just want to kind of go back to what you mentioned, uh, Carol, about being sort of in Europe and then going back the other way. Our view on this side of the pond is very much that we're worried about. Well, okay, I, I certainly would be worried about going to the U.S. and uh, and what the risks uh, associated with that would be, because from our perspective, the numbers are actually pretty low. Um, and ironically, I'm going to do a little bit of um, pasting here, and I'm just going to drop you in a, a kind of global tour map. And I created this after Paris, um, just to kind of see where 2014s. What's it called? Oops, there's you. Are. Um, I, I can still see you, Angela, don't I? Um, but um, ah! <laughs> but um, the, what you can see there is an interactive map to allow you to see where the previous 12 months worth of attacks were. Um, and what you can uh, you can see is that the numbers are very much concentrated in um, somewhat Middle Eastern sort of arena. Now, I'm, I'm, I've am I'm got the full data set of this, which actually does come from a US university who's doing this um, research. So I'm tying together a few different maps um, to give a more holistic um, temporal um, presentation of this data. And I probably will uh, sort of open source as long as they're happy enough for me to do that, which I will have to ask an attribute um, to. So um, this is just to kind of at least educate people into what they should or shouldn't be fearing, if that makes any sense. Um, is that all right? Does that kind of help, help sort of explain sort of my side of the story as a bit yeah. living here, but also yeah. someone who's very conscious about um, researching their own information as opposed to just taking stuff at face value? Mm -hmm. Because there's always, there's always an element where you could risk skewing stuff. And I think there's, there's a little bit of a concern in some arena on both sides of the pond. Because, of course, you, you, uh, most people, I'm assuming, um, you can probably tell me more, Angela. What do people feel about places like Brussels or probably Paris before that, or even London and 7 7? How do they um, react to that? What's that? Well, I feel like it's really split. I mean, I'm an NPR girl. I've got a couple of working class gigs, so I have my finger on the pulse of the Fox News <laughs> audience. <laughs> we have the other side. Yeah. yeah, sure. And so I, f I feel like that split is really uh, pronounced to me. And I don't know, sometimes I think they think that I'm, uh, you know, the same things that they said about Gore when he was running for president, right? Oh, he's up in the clouds somewhere. He's not thinking, what about the real people, blah, blah, blah. And so I really see it as divided between, especially right now during this election, mm -hmm between a kind of, you know, and I hate to generalize about the proletariat or anything because I'm, you know, sort of a pro-labor party kind of girl, but I, I feel like it's really split. Yeah, we certainly feel have that exactly that same sort of um, position on our side of the, the, the pond. Um, there's definitely a sort of split between, oddly along classically almost um, class lines, I suppose, which is a bit, yes. you know, in difficult in yes. different ways, but yeah. Because we get so we're educational at least, just yeah, to try think, to problematize it a little bit. Yeah, I think I think that that's probably a more accurate description. I would agree with. Yeah, that. yeah definitely. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah that's thanks for that. Yeah, good stuff. Well, and, and I, I think you know, kind of you know, just looking at. I, I didn't open the link because I wanted it to see all of you. And, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. I'm new. No, no, it's, I'm glad you did. Um, but that being said, I, I just feel that um, we are, in a way, I mean. Terror is defined so differently. I mean, if we, yeah. if we look, I mean, you know, I mean, one of the the opportunities to, I had an opportunity to talk directly or or kind of make a statement and or question with Marion Williamson, and it was just it was clear that that we are carrying forward this this energy, this energy of fear, right. and we're, we're we're giving it to our kids, and we're not challenging them on on it. On it, there aren't enough options you know, in the realm of content, you know, I mean, if 89% of the games that kids are currently playing contain elements of violence, and even looking at Minecraft, I mean, Minecraft is the game that we want to use as the playground for the graphene creation zone, and and that's getting more violent, yeah. just, you know, they're adding more, you know, interesting weaponry, and, um, and so, of course, in order to meet kids where they are, and I mean, maybe this is where we get to have a substantive conversation is like, right. is it a good idea to to add a graphene coating to a sword to to meet kids where they are in the Minecraft world, or or should we figure out another aspect 
of creation, you know, within the, you know, and so it's just like, I'm throwing it out there as a question. I don't fully know the answer to right. so. I'm, I'm, part of me thinks we don't have a choice, right? Because if you want them to play, that's where they are in bulk. And there's something also that goes back to the packaging of violence thing. Even the games that aren't overtly violence are usually competitive in a way that they need to get something from somebody else or they need to accrue more than somebody else. I keep asking my kids, why can't you build a bridge together so that animals can cross over the highway? Isn't there a Greenpeace game that you could, you know, and if my son wants to sweet talk me into something, he'll say, but we're going to play that we're, we're joining together against the big corporations. Mm -hmm. And that will usually try to, you know, he'll try to convince me that way. <laughs> but I, I think that if those games are really out there, my kids don't know about them. Mm -hmm. They're both Minecrafters. My girl is also a gamer girl. And we talk a lot about these issues but I don't have them completely solved. But my instinct is to say, get them where they're at. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd have to second that because one of the biggest problems is when trying to change, if you like, the world is you can't boil the ocean all at the same time. Um, you right. have to, as you say, quite rightly, I think I, I have to support exactly what Angela said. Um, even in business, you cannot change yourself from point A to point B straight away. It's one step at a time. And that mm. means that you probably have to start from where they are, the baseline, if you like, and then what's your next transition to get you down the road? So I, I definitely agree with with Angela in that you might have to consider looking at Minecraft. In fact, I think you probably will have to consider looking at Minecraft and introducing that element into it. Um, because, but then if it travels in the right direction, it's cool as long as we get there and in the right way, as opposed to us going around the house and essentially risking something in the process. It's just the nature of change. Even an organization is trying to change everybody uh, through dictate overnight doesn't usually work or out all that well. So, and I'm I'm totally with you. I mean, I just you know I, I feel that this is now everybody's movement, and 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 so what I what I celebrate most about this conversation is that it's not just me, and uh, right. we all, we all get to to weigh in and say how what do we want the world to look like for our kids? Are we willing to mm -hmm. to draw a hard line and and does it help that that there's more than just one parent on this call on this you know show, and 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 how would it feel to join together and really be in solidarity, and and say like this is you know the hypocritical oath <laughs> in a way like you know uh, Carol and I are, are writing this book called Conscious Disruption and we're we're all kind of putting ourselves on different hypoc like the spectrum of hypocrisy you know, or the hypocrisy index. And, and so if our values, you know, say, you know what, violence is not going to happen in my house. And, right. and there's a group of parents that say, okay, you can play Minecraft, but only the graphene based Minecraft, you know, and, and, and we're going to, you know, find a way for, for our kids to, to understand what our values are with more intention. So, I mean, that part just feels, um, uh, like I, I just feel more emboldened as a parent than ever before, you know, given what just happened. Um, Let's see people and, and, um, yeah, no, that's so thank you, uh, yeah. uh, Muhammad and uh, and Luke for joining. Um, so if anyone, there is one last chair available. We, we don't have too much longer to 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 talk on this end because it's it's kind of getting later in the evening as it is. Uh, um, Nine something p.m. in in this part of the world. Um, so uh, so uh, to to catch the the new people who just joined in, uh, this is the Game Changer Movement virtual living room where we meet every week to talk about how we're going to change the game and shift the content that our kids get to experience in, uh, in the gaming world. And our global vision is to inspire at least one million youth to trade in violent video games and and become part of a game changing community where we're going to literally create impact in the world through the games that we play. And so instead of just making negative policies around, you know, being against violent video games, we're going to just tell the world what we're for. And, and I feel like that's that's what I've, I mean, after 
experiencing Mary Williamson. And, you know, we, we actually met with her afterwards and had, oh, you know, wow. this conversation and, you know, she may endorse our, our, um, our book and, uh, and she may allow us to honor her at a, um, I don't know, fundraising event that we're hopefully going to host in New York City where she just is, is moving to in mid-April. Um, so, I mean, a lot of movement is happening. And the reason I bring up Marianne Williamson so much is that, you know, this is the time where I feel like the spiritual world and the, the practical world are starting to coalesce. And, and it takes all, you know, all kinds of people to create the peace that, that we all want to experience in this world. And, and I'm just so grateful that you know, that Carol's in the world to, to just hold the space for what Europe gets to feel like, and, you know, when I go back, you know, and Eric is here and Ethar is, you know, I mean, so like we are, I mean, and, and I guess one of the other updates that I wanted to share is that, um, you know, Ethar and I are going to work on creating a uh, hack day where we're actually going to figure out how to bring the graphene world into the game space. And uh, we're going to, I mean, Gra Manchester was one of these, like, the, the energy, I mean, you know, in all honesty, Manchester and Pittsburgh felt a lot similar, you know, yeah, and so yeah. I feel like there's a lot of ingenuity and innovation that comes out of both places that it, it doesn't really get enough credit for. I know, that, I mean, you know, Manchester has, like, the birth control pill and graphene and a few other, you know, amazing um, <laughs> Are, are total game changers, right? Yeah. You know, in lots, lots of different respects. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, talk about a historical perspective. You know, I mean, the what came out of uh, Manchester in the fifties created a new era of of relatedness. You know, because when people no longer needed to worry as much about worry, whatever that word is, um, about making more babies. Um, then people were able to be a lot more intentional with uh, with their gaming. Nice. I think well, it, yeah. it, it did so in a number of other ways as well, because of course, the, as I probably mentioned, the first stored program computer was also built in this city, and um, that and that was basically the baseline for how a lot of modern day computing is done. Um, so uh, you know, so in in another way, the interconnectedness happened potentially because of that too. Because of course, without that, there's no computing devices. There would eventually be no protocols that would have connected people across, um, you know, the internet, etc. So, so yes, it was quite. And so you're talking about like just so that people playing at home, so to speak, can uh, follow along. You're talking about like the cracking of the Enigma code yeah. computer. Well, yes. well, actually, it was it was based off the. Off a couple of generations after that, if you like, because cracking the Enigma code was the processing parts of it. The stored program, you couldn't store a program on the on the thing that cracked the Enigma code. So there was no real RAM or place to put it. Does that make sense? So it's like the, before that, it was all punch cards and you'd all run them all through and hope for the best. Um, I hope you didn't get a single hole in the wrong place or someone had not mispunched something in 30,000 stacks of, of card, which was really painful to get that wrong. Um, but so the first stored program computer allows you to put the program onto the computer, although through a series of digits and and, and dials, um, and then run what you've stored, which is basically how programs work today um, within computers. So yes, that's what we we built. Just saying. Um, so <laughs> so yeah. So that's yeah. I mean, like look at look at the building blocks. So I mean, you know, here we've got graphene and we've got steel. You know, we've got yeah. a lot of like you know raw materials and you know and and we've got Carnegie Mellon, which actually had the Foldit game come out of it. That I was yeah. you know inspired. You know, one of the one of the times that I got really sick for twelve days in a row, and I just learned, learned, learned. You know, from YouTube. Um, this Foldit game was amazing, and and now it's you know literally cracking the Enigma code of HIV. Um, so and so it's just it's a really ripe time. You know I feel like uh, here we are in in Brussels, and we're all healing together. And um, and I mean in a way because of what happened in Brussels, um, my my flight was delayed until tomorrow. So I was. You know, we're able to to coalesce, you know, on this soil, and and I feel like um, that's meaningful, and 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 it and it, and it feels like um, like solidarity 
starts, you know, happen, builds and grows more and more every day. You know, that being said, there was supposed to be a rally here yesterday and it was canceled, you know, due to like heightened security challenges. So I heard that. So I feel like, you know, we are in a way part of the baby steps because we're coalescing, you know, in the safety of our houses, um, but we're coalescing nonetheless. And this is recording. So we're going to transform this into a YouTube and those who weren't able to experience it live will be able to experience it in the future. And even the, the presentation that you experienced, Ethar, in Manchester may or may not exist in recorded history. So um, it, it's, it's, it's a video recorded history, but it may not be an audio recorded right. history. So we're going <laughs> yeah, to that. Yeah. Um, but that being said, um, you know, I just, I want to celebrate you specifically, Ethar, because I mean, you, uh, candidly said that you were interested in attending and, and if it was just about the gun culture of the US, you were gonna find a way to leave early. And I'm, you know what I mean? And, and, I'm, and I'm really glad that you didn't because the conversation broadened to a, a place of connection. And, and I feel like you know, because of that, you know, we had the following day together and, and because of the dinner you know, that happened following the, the presentation, we all really got to know where our missions aligned. <clears throat> and, you know, um, you know, I mean, what Carol brings to the table a lot is she always says where two or more are gathered, you know, God is present. And and that is true. Whatever your, your faith position is, um, you know, when more hearts gather and, and connect, so much more is possible. And, Excuse me. Bless you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And thank you all for I love that we can like say good bless you, like, you know, <laughs> thousands of miles away. Um, thank so, you. Thank you. Yeah. I was bringing God into the situation. <laughs> <laughs> there you were. There you were. Okay. So, so uh, Erica, did you want to? I mean, I don't want to put you on the spot. No, but, this is great. You know. It's uh, my first time uh, listening to this, and it's so great to hear. I, I just am watching how um, involved everybody is. Like, I do a lot of these um, types of calls for work, and people are like zoning out, and everybody's so engaged and nodding along. Oh. And I love your it's a it's a very enthusiastic mm, yeah yeah I, I do a lot of those for work as well i totally get what you're saying um so yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. Good stuff. so i mean i i appreciate you all and and i i just you know i i feel like this conversation is expanding and i mean the the blab that or the virtual living room we had two weeks ago uh was was a very interesting one because it felt so good in the beginning we somehow through the power of internet recruitment, we had two <laughs> gentlemen from India who were, you know, game designers. Yeah. And then- um, Oh, I left then, that early. That took a turn yeah. with it. Mm. And then it, and it shifted and then it shifted back. So I guess I just wanted to kind of bring it full circle and, and share that. So what happened was there was these two game designers, they apparently left their dorm room with their computer, you know, exposed or whatever, and exposed is sort of the key word because um, other people grabbed a hold of their profile and started going on other blab rooms and posted pornographic, you know, videos or something. Uh. So when a 17-year-old that I had had this great connection with the the week in it earlier uh, came on board, he also recruited his following and basically. Um, one of the people from his following said, you know, like there was uh, some really bad behavior within the Blab community. And now that was a very, um, you know, I was in this space of like, I had this hour plus long conversation with these two guys who didn't do anything with their screen that I wouldn't have wanted them to do. And, and then, you know, but the question is, you know, even though this was a virtual environment, what is our accountability and how do we rise up to to give each of the participants and especially if they're under 18 a sense of safety and so i was i was questioning so much and then what happened as a, like in follow up and i just wanted to give everyone who is faithful to this blab an update <clears throat> is a day after that happened um, the two gentlemen who were coders, you know, they got to the bottom of what had happened with their computer 
and they apologized profusely and they shared with me and they said that you know if you still want to collaborate we're we're gonna we would love to collaborate with this energy and and so i wrote them back and said that you know we would stay in touch and then the day after the 17 year old apologized and said that he had overreacted and that he was um he was sorry that he he kind of um uh, hijacked the show in a way wow. and so I mean, and I guess it just kind of comes full circle to the idea of, you know, forgiveness and true apology, because, you know, in this global perspective, we are, you know, um, just north of Germany, who apparently has set a huge example in the world by apologizing for the things that it does wrong, you know, right. you know, with regard to the Holocaust and, and other other injustices and and now they're experiencing more prosperity you know and and less targeting from you know other forces and so it's just very um it's a huge conversation to be part of and so uh i appreciate you all for your continued commitment angela it's it's I, I feel a road trip to Pittsburgh, you know, um, boiling. I'm next. I'm next. <laughs> yay. <laughs> yay. So, um, so thank you all. And, uh, and it'll be close to the same time, same place. <clears throat> week. We're, we're still trying to find the, the sweet spot for timing because in the States, um, when school's back in session, right. in the session right now, um, you know, a, as we in, want to involve more and more youth, uh, this isn't the right time because most right. kids will still be in school. And so um, it's so clear that it is time to make sure that we hold the space for youth with every decision we make, every conversation we have. And, and so that's that's my continued commitment as we go forward. So uh, does anyone have any more to, to share? Or? No, thank you for opening this question up and for traveling the world and for letting us keep coming back. Mm -hmm. and, and I, I just like to ditto that really, because I, I certainly think there's, there's, especially in the UK, a big movement towards um, getting involved in aspects of programming, a lot obviously gaming, uh, more or less out of the bat, off the bat well. Um, so I think that certainly on my side, we've tried to chase up the, um, the appropriate members, if you like, that within this city that can certainly help in that regard as well. So, uh, Excellent. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much, and uh, we'll see you. However, many of you want to come back next week. Yeah. No Bye, guys. Bye now. Thank Bye. You. Nice to meet you. Bye. You Bye. 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 Bye.